Praise the Lord. It's a lot bigger up here when you're nervous. Uh, good to see everybody today. Um, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Hebron family, for coming in today. I know it's pretty cold. If you're joining us online or you're watching this later, I hope that the word of God uh, blesses you. Um, now, without further delay, let's turn to Psalm 51. If you guys could join me um, in reading the word, uh, you can stay seated. I know you've been standing for a while. Um, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold with me a willing spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You would not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, will you, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure, Build up the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Um, so as I was trying to decide what to speak on uh, the past couple of weeks, um, my, the one word that kept coming to my mind consistently and constantly was the word brokenness. Um, and in this past season of my life, what God has been teaching me more than anything uh, is, is the heart behind brokenness. And, and so we can title today's message to be Brokenness in Christ. Um, so Psalm 51 uh, has the background coming from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Um, if you guys want, you can turn to it and, and look at it. But we see the story of David and Bathsheba. We see uh, David. It's very interesting. We don't have time to dive too deep in it. But if you read uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When the time that kings uh, went out for war, David stayed, and instead he sent Job, his commander, uh, along the, with the rest of his servants. And so um, we don't have time to dive into all of that, but I found it very intriguing that David, in the previous chapter, who was, um, was fighting for God and for, for uh, the uh, acquisition, expansion of his land and, and for the people suddenly decided to stop. And so this got me thinking, and, 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 and God began to reveal to me, that's what happens when brokenness enters our life. It's slow, it's small, it may be massive, and it comes quick, but it leaves us in a place of utter disarray. And that's what happens. And in this story, you see David, who fell into lust, and from lust to adultery, which led him to murder, and from murder almost into a denial for almost a year before the man of God, Nathan, came and uh, brought the, uh, the word of God to him uh, about uh, basically in a parable or a story saying, David, there is a man in your kingdom who has committed this great sin. And David, who acts as a judge and a king at the same time, is indignant. He's angry and he's saying, 
who is this man and how can we bring justice? And Nathan clearly says to him, this is you. People of God, I think oftentimes we, we, we go about our lives living so passively, we don't understand that there's brokenness in our life. And, uh, and, and, and it came to me in a funny way. Uh, who's ever broken like one of your mom's bathrooms, like the glass ones in the kitchen, right? And so I've done it a lot. Um, so, so, you know, you'll try to sweep it up and you'll hide it away. But at some point, that one little glass piece will be somewhere. And So it'll, it'll be in someone's leg somewhere and you'll never hear the end of it, right? So just like that, David's brokenness started with the small, simple sin of lust. And it started with a look and it became into an action and it kept on going forward. But the thing about David that set him apart from a lot of people like Saul or, or many other people that we've seen that fall is that he had a level of brokenness that led him to something different, right? So uh, if we can go to the next slide, brokenness in Christ helps us to recognize our sin and hate it. So in verses 1 to 3, we see a David who says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. How evil must it have been for David to cry from his inward being, blot it out. Take this away, God, because only you can wash me of this iniquity and cleanse me of this sin. See, what, what really happened at the end of the day is David began to realize the depravity of sin and sin of itself. And this is not an easy thing to say or preach and, 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 and far from it that I'm perfect in saying this. But as Christians, oftentimes what we do is we look at our sin and we say, ah, Jesus, forgive me. And we walk away. We don't think about the depravity or how greatly we've hurt the Christ who died on the cross for us. Yet we just say, oh, if I say I'm sorry, it'll be okay. Everything's going to be fine. But David, if you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, his response after Nathan uh, told him of his great sin, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. But there is a consequence. See, David didn't make excuses. He didn't say, God, it was because someone did something to me. Someone hurt me. Someone said something about me. He said, God, I've sinned. And he recognized his sin. And he said, and he came to that point of recognizing that his transgressions are before him. And, and that he needed the forgiveness and which leads us to uh, recognizing that brokenness in Christ leads us to godly grief and repentance. And we've heard messages from our elders and pastors throughout the years about how godly grief is so vital and important to us, especially in our pursuit of Jesus. Um, if we read verses 4 through 6, we see David crying out and saying, God, I recognize that I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. See, we don't understand that sometimes the things that are in our hearts, uh, whether it be malice, envy, anger, hatred, all these things that are, that are in our lives are actually sin in God's eyes. He sees it as sin. He sees it as something vile. And that leads to a godly grief. A, a grief that makes David go to the throne room of God while his child is dying, even though he knows he's going to die. And when he gets up at the end of the day, he's still looking back to God and he's saying, I'm going to worship you regardless of this, because that is true repentance. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what is happening in your life, you're still going to say, God, I've sinned and I'm coming to that point of repentance. We can see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, as it is, I rejoice, Paul is saying here, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt godly grief so that you suffered no loss through this. And that godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief, it produces death. See, oftentimes when we just feel grief, it goes away. It doesn't mean anything. 
Oh, I've, I've lied. I've sinned against my brother. Oh, it's fine. I've said something offensive. I can't count how many times I've said something offensive to my own brothers. And I just think, ah, they'll get over it. But the reality is that true repentance brings us to a point of understanding that this sin, this thing that's weighing in us, this brokenness that we live in, that we get so used to living in, saying harsh words or living in that consistently, is actually breaking us down inside. And so we cry out to a God and we say, God, against you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight. Church, do we have that attitude about our brokenness? To say, God, how great is my sin before you. That I have done this vile thing in your sight. That the words that I say, the the way that I live my life is actually so vile and disgusting before you, Jesus. Do we have the audacity... How do we have the audacity to look at the creator of the universe and say, I'm sorry. And that's about it. And that's about as much as we can give to him. You see, David's heart is filled with so much grief. Thinking that, man, I'm, I'm willing to lose everything else for this one momentary pleasure. But he turns and he says, God, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your repentance See, this godly grief leads us to repentance and eventually that brokenness will end us to leading us eventually to um, the process of sanctification. Now, this this is a very big topic, but David talks about it in verses 7 through 10 and he highlights and he goes, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That word purge, do you know how, how deep that word is? To actually scrape out every fiber of the being so that it doesn't even exist. So that there is no spot, no blemish in you. And how many of us can go on and say in verse 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. How many of us say, God, the correction, that process of sanctification I'm going to rejoice in that. I don't rejoice in that. I don't remember a single beating that I took that I enjoyed. But but here David's saying, God, that brokenness that you brought me to, even if it led me to the worst point of my life, even if I've lost everything before that, I'm going to rejoice. That doesn't make sense as a normal human being. You see a David who's rejected by his family, is rejected by his brothers, rejected by his king, rejected by his wife. He's seen all these successes and goes down because of his own sin. And he's saying, I'm broken, but that brokenness is rejoicing. And we see Paul talking about it, rejoicing in our sufferings and so many other things, right? But that process of sanctification, how many of us can boldly say... I enjoyed that. See, David goes on to say, hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. He says it over and over again. Why does he keep saying it? Why does he keep saying, God, would you just blot this out? Would you take this away from me? Because that's the depravity of man as we know it. That we fall into sin again and again. Yet there is a Savior who died on the cross for you and I. Now, this message isn't anything new or it isn't anything uh, mind-blowing, but rather a point of realizing that the brokenness in our lives leads us through a process, a complete process of transformation in our lives. And ultimately, brokenness leads us to being made whole in Christ. And we see that in the rest of the chapter. David cries out, God, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. That process isn't just surface level. It isn't just like wearing clothes and putting on the outside. It's a creation of something new. See, brokenness is from a place of utter destruction, of utter pieces. And only the true king of kings, the God of gods who molds our hearts and has our life in his hands 
is the one who can create a new heart in us. And he's saying, God, create in me that clean heart. It means something has to die, something has to leave. And he says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Children of God, how many times have we sinned against God or continue to live in habitual sin? And yet all we do is say, God, forgive me and walk away. Because here God, David is saying, God, I can't even be away from your presence. Don't take me away from this, this thing that gives me life. Don't take away the Holy Spirit from me. Does our brokenness help us realize that we are losing more eternally than we're gaining momentarily? Are we realizing at the end of the day that brokenness is not something that is happening to us but for us again and again and again? And he's saying, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold a willing spirit in me. Is brokenness leading us to realize That we need him so much that even in brokenness, the joy is his salvation. That's what we read in in, in 2 Corinthians, right? That it's ultimately leading to a salvation. Salvation that comes from him and him alone. And we go throughout the rest of the chapter and you can see in verse 16 and 17 for sure. But even in 13 and 14... I didn't even recognize this, but he's saying then, then, after this, after this process, or even through this process, I will teach transgressors your ways, not mine. David's saying, God, as you're teaching me this process, as you're teaching me this brokenness, I want to teach others not to do this or what to do when they're broken and living in this brokenness. And he knows, when you look back at the story of Saul, look, that's what he's saying in 16 and 17. For you will not delight in sacrifices. There's nothing on the fr- surface level that you can do that's going to make it look like you're okay and that you're good. He's saying, he remembers what Saul did. He's heard of it. He offered sacrifices. He did it. David is not lacking in anything. He's, he's saying, I would give it to you if, if you would be, if you'd not be pleased, you would just not be pleased with the burnt offering because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. So children of God, today what I've come here to say is, is not that brokenness is easy or that life is going to be good. This year alone, we've experienced so much heartbreak in our own lives, in our church, whether it may be finances, your family, children, school, whatever it may be. Maybe it's habitual sin that you're living in and you're struggling with. The sacrifices of God are that of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. One that is saying, God, would you not forgive me? Would you not blot out this great transgression that is in me? Would you not take this from me? And you see that as David is, uh, is responding to that. How many of us can live a life like that? To recognize our sin. Understanding that we are so fallen short of his glory. That. We need that godly grief and repentance, even for the small things we say against our brothers and sisters. And that we need that repentance leading us to that constant sanctification in our life. Ultimately being made whole in him. Brothers and sisters, how long are we going to live in brokenness and not recognize there are small things in our life? Are we truly asking God? God, in my brokenness, will you not meet me here? Would you not take this sin? Are we looking at him saying, God, I'm too broken. I don't want you anymore. I'm comfortable living in this sin. I'm okay uh, just letting it pass and slide. And if you've heard nothing of what I said so far, I really encourage you to go read Psalm 51. Because the amount of times I wept over this passage thinking, God, how many times do I do this in my own life daily, if not weekly?
God, in our brokenness, how much can we cry out to God and say, God, I am a broken and feeble human being. And we look at a broken Jesus in Hebrews 12. Right? We see, therefore, that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we're laying aside every weight of sin and running with the endurance with the race that is set before us, this life. And we go to verse uh, 2, and we look unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shames, and seated at the right-hand throne of God. And yet this is the beautiful story of Christ's love for us, right, in our brokenness. So church today, if you're, if you're facing that brokenness in your own life, if you're going through that hardship and you don't know what to do, I encourage you, I beg of you to reach out to the creator of the universe. Maybe you're listening to this online or later on, or maybe you never even had that relationship with God. And you're living in brokenness now and you don't know what to do. Cry out to God today and say, Father, would you not forgive me? Of this sin, would you not blot out my transgressions that are before me? Even the simple things, the the small things that I'm saying, that I'm doing, the way that I'm living, my attitude towards my brothers and sisters, my family, my co-workers, those around me, God. Those transgressions that I think are small in my sight, but great in your eyes. God, would you not sanctify me and make me whole in you? Church, if you could bow your head with me. Father, we just thank you, Jesus, for this time to come before your throne of grace, God. God, this message is not new, Lord Jesus. It is not something deep. But, Father God, it is what we need, oh, Lord Jesus, to understand that we are broken in you, Father. God, I pray, Father, for everyone seated here and those listening, oh, God. I pray, Father, that you would create in us a clean heart, oh, Father God, and a contrite spirit to understand our brokenness. Lord, We accept you into our lives as our Savior, and we recognize, oh, Father God, what you've done on the cross for us, oh, Jesus. And we give you glory, oh, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. May the name of the Lord be glorified. Amen.